Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to the Decibel from the Globe and Mail. You probably remember the historic flooding that hit British Columbia last November. Thousands of people were displaced, hundreds of thousands of animals were killed, and crucial infrastructure was damaged. At one point, Canada's largest port, the Port of Vancouver, was completely cut off from the rest of the country. Canada's largest port, Vancouver, was cut off on Tuesday by major flooding and landslides, which have killed at least one person and left two more missing across British Columbia. Since then, there's been a lot of discussion about how we can better prepare for this kind of extreme event. And there's one very simple but very important thing that protects people from flooding. It's called a dike or a levee. It's a reinforced embankment built up alongside a body of water. We have about 1,100 kilometers worth of dikes um, and they've allowed farms and settlements in places that would otherwise be prone to flooding. That's the Globe's Justine Hunter. We've got floodplains in the Fraser Valley, Metro Vancouver, Hundreds of thousands of people in homes and schools and hospitals, all the crucial transportation corridors, billions of dollars worth of development that have all built up behind these structures that are, for the most part, not in very good shape. There are 105 dikes in B.C. that no one is responsible for. Neither cities nor the province want to take ownership of them. They're known as orphan dikes. We've come to depend on them in a big way, but we haven't really done the maintenance that needed to be done. Justine spent some time with an engineer named Tamsin Lyle, who studies these dikes. It's hard to convince um, somebody to take authority for an orphan system because they're potentially taking on something that is totally falling apart, um, that has a huge liability if it fails. Today on the show, Justine and Tamsin visit one of these dikes in the Vancouver community of Southlands. This is a, I grew up in Vancouver, and this is a part of Vancouver I never saw. It's this lovely kind of pastoral scene. It's tucked away near the University of British Columbia on the Fraser River. And you go down there, and there's just these amazing estates, but they've all got their own private paddocks for their horses. As they walked along it, they talked about the history of BC's orphan dikes and why someone needs to take responsibility for them before the next big flood. This is The Decibel. challenge across the province that we have not only a lot of dikes that don't meet current standards that are theoretically the responsibility of somebody, but they don't necessarily have the capacity or resources to maintain them or, or remove them. Also have- Tamsin Lyle is, uh, she's an, uh, an engineer who specializes in uh, flood protection issues. You know, there's a lot of people that work in this area, but she's been uh, running her own firm and doing a lot of work to help communities understand the risks and understand the options. What are we looking at? So right now we're on one of British Columbia's many orphan dikes. So these are dikes that were constructed by landowners in a sort of ad hoc fashion when the areas were first developed. Essentially, you've got two slopes on either side of a flat top. And the weakness is where the water's running up on the one side. So you've got your dry area behind it that's supposed to be protected. And say you've got the Fraser River, as in the case of the Southlands, uh, running along the one side. You want to keep the water, especially when it's running fast, from sort of tearing away the structures. So they were uh, created with minimal design um, and engineering. So... This beautiful day, the tides is low. quiet and low, um, not quite slack, but what are the threats that you see as you're walking along? What can go wrong here? Um, the main concern here isn't actually the Fraser River, it's the ocean. So that's what controls all of the water levels here. So it's the big storms. When we get the storm surges, this will raise the water in the river system for about a meter. And then with sea level rise, 
um, anticipating even more uh, increased elevations in here. So the issue here now is that we have the, the river systems that are flowing out through Southlands, through the gates. And so as the river rises, the water will backflow into those river systems and actually begin to flood out the neighborhood. And then the dike is a top edge. So the provincial authority that's supposed to be in charge of dikes has done some assessments and they concluded that most of the dikes in the province don't fully meet provincial standards. So the, the report on orphan dikes is in two parts. And one part is at one engineering firm that looked at the actual structures of these dikes. So they went and found them and, and inspected them. The other part is, and this is where uh, Tams and Lyle's firm comes in, is assessing the risk. So it's not just a matter of, is this dike sound? But it's what are the values that are behind that dike? What, what is being protected? And so what's at risk? And when you combine those two assessments, if you've got a dike that is not, not in good shape and is at a high probability of failing, uh, if there's nothing of huge value behind that, it's not really a big problem. The problem is when you have a very uh, heavy amount of development or critical infrastructure behind those dikes, people's homes, people's livelihoods, uh, infrastructure that's required, say, uh, an airport. You know, if, if the Vancouver airport uh, was inundated, they would have a problem that would have repercussions right across the country. So... We've had diking infrastructure in the province for more than 100 years. Um, and the very early diking structures were built by farmers and developers um, who were wanting to keep their crops dry. Um, the big uh, diking infrastructure was mostly put in place um, in the wake of the 1948 flood. So in 1948, the Fraser um, experienced the second largest flood of written, written record, um, so in the last hundred or so years, um, and it was pretty damaging at the time. Um, there were a couple of deaths attributed to this event. Um, my understanding of the deaths that occurred were as a result of the dike breaches because it was quite sudden and fast. Um, a parallel to what happened in November um, was that the, the major transportation corridors uh, that connect British Columbia to the rest of Canada were disrupted. So what happened in November um, was, in some cases, that flood protection failed. We had this trio of extreme rain events that hit southern BC. The first atmospheric river was 4,000 kilometers long, 500 kilometers wide. And our river systems just kind of exploded. And even as people were scrambling to clean up and repair from that first one, another two storms followed that did even more damage. So the toll was it's billions of dollars worth of damages. Railways, hydro lines, pipelines, dikes, bridges, key highways. Thousands of residents were displaced, uh, 1,100 farms underwater. There was a point in mid-November where we did not have a single rail or road route between Vancouver and the BC interior. So... Canada's biggest port, the Port of Vancouver, was uh, shut down basically for a week. And that, of course, had um, implications for our national supply chain. And so there, in the, the 1948 flood, there was a sort of a lot of concern locally around what had happened and what, you know, what could be done differently. And then also this recognition that it was creating impacts across the country. Uh, so the federal government of the day um, and the provincial government of the day decided that the best way to move forward was um, to restore the public faith in the diking system. They decided the best way to restore the public faith in the diking system was to send out two gentlemen engineers, which is what it says in the report, um, out from Toronto to come and fix the problem. And they, they did exactly what they were told. They were given this mandate that it's all about getting the diking infrastructure back up and running. Um, and the design that they came up with um, is very much what we still see today. Morning. So, morning. morning. The design that they chose was sort of the standard Dutch design of a dike with a top and two slopey sides. Um, and it says right in the executive summary of the report, um, that these two engineers submitted that all of the work was done without the usual tedious surveys and calculations. 
<laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Good boys. Excellent. <laughs>Right across British Columbia right now, we're going to see uh, whether or not we're prepared for the flood, the annual flood season this spring, and it, it sort of starts usually in June. There's some substantial changes to rivers as a result of the floods in November, and so there's a, not a lot of certainty about how the rivers are going to react when you get a huge amount of water and snow melt and, uh, coming in in the next few weeks. And so we have a situation where the original dikes um, that were designed uh, were designed without the usual tedious surveys and calculations and therefore are subject to failure. And then we have all these other dikes that aren't even meeting those standards. And so we've created this really fragile system because we've put a lot of eggs in one basket in terms of these structural responses. And there are so many people who live behind these dikes who either don't know the dikes that are that are there at all. And if they do know that they're there, they have a, a false sense of security that these are infallible. Um, and in fact, dikes fail all the time, as witnessed in the November events. We saw actually an unknown amount of <laughs> dike failures. It depends who you talk to, um, how many actually failed. So... Most of the dikes in British Columbia are the responsibility of local governments, and that's thanks to this move by the provincial government in 2003 to offload responsibility for flood protection. So the province sets the standards, and then there are about 100 diking authorities across the province that are supposed to do the maintenance. The authority that kind of overarches and, and looks over you know, what the standards are has concluded uh, in the most recent survey that most of the dikes in the province that are regulated don't fully meet the provincial standards. So we know there's a problem. And then you've got this other class of dikes. These are orphan dikes that were built at some point in the distant past, usually thrown up in some response to an emergency and then kind of forgotten. And some of those are just entirely lost, and some of them still have an important role. So whole neighborhoods built behind them. And whether those people that live there know it or not, people are depending on these structures to keep them safe. So you've got this battle going on around local governments don't want to take on the liability and cost of these structures. And the province doesn't really want to take it on either. I mean, I guess it, it's hard to convince um, somebody to take authority for an orphan system because they're potentially taking on something that is totally falling apart, um, that has a huge liability if it fails. Yeah. And so there's a lot of concern. I mean, if you don't have authority or responsibility for a dike, I mean, I can understand why you wouldn't want to be that that adoptive parent. Merritt was one of the hardest hit communities in November uh, with the floods. And it really showed just how all our planning doesn't really hold up to the reality of what we're seeing with extreme weather events. So there's two rivers that run through the Nicola Valley and, and right at the confluence of the uh, cold water and the Nicola rivers is where this community of Merritt settled. So it's the bottom of the valley. They've got two rivers running through town. The concern had always been the Nicola would flood. And so all their flood protection and their flood plans all sort of uh, were based on the idea that the Nicola would flood in the spring freshet. What happened in November was the cold water uh, backed up basically right through town. And most of downtown and a lot of communities down by the river uh, were flooded. The entire town was evacuated because the city works yard, of course, was based right down by the river. That's where their sewage and water treatment plant was. And so for a couple of weeks, people didn't have safe running water and they couldn't use their toilet. So they had to evacuate the entire town. But a huge number of homes were wiped out. Um, I spoke to people that live in a trailer park right by the water, on the cold water. And some of those homes were just ripped away and floated down the river. Um, and it was uh, a woman described just coming out of her trailer at 2.30 in the morning. She was being evacuated and people were screaming. There were children screaming from the, uh, the, the campground next door and the, just the chaos. She managed to leave with 
her litter of puppies, some dog food, and her husband's ashes. That's all she had time to grab. People just left with nothing uh, to get out. So it was uh, an example of how we need to rethink what the risk is because you know the floodplain maps they were working with the emergency crews were working with were were not that accurate in the end so what i mean it's definitely one of the challenges right now is that none of our infrastructure meets our current standards and so anticipating to to make them even taller makes it very sort of overwhelming for municipalities so they, the dike that runs you know, north-south that faces the, the Salish Sea um, nominally like, have to be something like nine meters high. So to manage sea level rise as well as all of the ocean storms that we're anticipating with climate change. Um, and at that point, the dike will just collapse in on itself. So you have to start looking at other solutions as well. So whether that's, well, I mean, the big one is maybe retreat, but maybe it's having more natural areas in front to kind of take the edge off the the uh, power of the waves and the storms so you can drop the height of the dike or using other sort of structural solutions. And of course, you know, as we build our dikes higher, we're also in a seismic zone. Um, so that makes them very fragile as well. So there are, you know, looking to different types of solutions. We have new guidelines that just came out on how to make dikes uh, seismically more functional. And it's very, 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 very expensive. If you were to fix every single orphan dike in the province right now, the bill would be close to a billion dollars. It's over $800 million, and that's in 2020 dollars. But that's not what is needed. Some of them need to be fixed. Some of them need to be removed. And in some cases, there's a difficult conversation to be had about where we need to restore nature and let the floodplain be a floodplain again. And that means retreat, which is a difficult word. It means, and it's happened in a number of communities right across Canada, uh, in places like High River, Alberta, and in parts of Gatineau in Quebec, where you just say, we, we are going to buy out the people that are living there. We're going to get them to re- remove themselves and these structures from the area that is going to flood. Uh, so rather than building back over and over again in the face of a flood and hoping that the flood protection measures work next time, sometimes it makes sense to just say we shouldn't have settled there in the first place, particularly with climate change where we're seeing more and more extreme weather events. Maybe it's time to, to back off and give the river its space. Justine's reporting on orphan dikes is part of No Safe Place, It's a year-long globe project spurred by last year's climate-related disasters in Western Canada. The catastrophic and deadly heat dome, fires, and floods in British Columbia revealed a hard truth about how ill-equipped Canadians are to respond to the devastating effects of climate change. You can read more from No Safe Place at theglobeandmail.com. That's it for today. I'm Manika Raman-Wilms. Ali Graham helped produce this episode. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Rachel Levy McLaughlin. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.